Hey everybody, one of the first episode of Let's Paint. Um, this is gonna be a series where basically I tackle frequently asked questions. <laughs> if someone asked me a whole bunch of times to do something, I may eventually do it in this series. Um, and this in particular was a question about how to paint uh, the terrain from the new Warhammer Age Sigmar Warcry. I get a lot of questions about how I get train done fast um, and what I do technique wise to try and like just save time and make it look good at the same time. Um, I use a technique I call the Schaefer method. <laughs> My buddy John Schaefer, um, who was responsible for a long time for getting train ready for things like grand tournaments, um, games days, uh, he, he did all kinds of the event stuff in the US for Games Workshop. Um, almost, I would say, perfected getting train done to look really nice really fast. And he used a double rattle can method that I really like. When I say double rattle can, what I mean is literally what you're seeing here on the table. You're seeing um, two different complementary colors that are just a spray paint. They're, they're, they're not an airbrush, they're not trying to like, do a whole bunch of fancy footwork with like unique tools you can't get on a hardware store. This is using hardware store supplies to get stuff done relatively quickly. Um, and when you're doing a rattle can method, you want to get two complementary colors, usually a dark brown undertone, uh, because what that does is grimes up all of the recesses of your train. You're going to prime the train in that color and then give it a overspray, usually at about a 45 degree angle, a zenith overspray, with whatever the cover color the train is supposed to be. So in this case, I'm using this Rust-Oleum Painter's Touch. What color is this? Nutmeg? <laughs> Am I on the French side here? I am on the French side. Uh, flat red primer. Um, and then I'm using Tidal Pond, a Rust-Oleum chalk paint. Uh, they do a series of great kind of like, just off strange colors, like they almost like a Space Wolf Gray, they do this cool turquoise. Um, and then a favorite of mine is this Rust-Oleum Painter's Touch Espresso. So uh, when I assemble these, because you see I put together the last three that I hadn't actually built and painted yet. Um, for all the other pieces in the kit, I left off all the wooden bits and the wooden construction that I could. So if you were doing your whole kit this way, using these as your primer colors, you'd want to leave off um, any of the gantry bits and walkway bits that, are, that you don't have to glue down right away and, and prime them separately. What I'm going to do here is I'm actually going to prime them first using this um, espresso color and then I'm going to mask them off and then do the rest of my priming afterwards. So I don't have to worry too much about being neat and tidy because uh, I'm going to get all the browns done and primed like after I do everything else. So uh, I'm going to be coming back after I do the primer. The other things you're going to need uh, for doing this, you need a medium sized dry brush. Now um, this is an old GW tank brush. If you can't get your hands on one of these, this, the large dry brush from Privateer Press is basically the same thing. They're, they're almost identical. I can use them pretty interchangeably because Workshop makes a flat dry brush now and I like these round dry brushes better. Um, a slightly smaller dry brush for picking out details and then if you want to do any fine work, just a layer brush from Citadel or like a zero or a one um, is going to be fine. The only other colors I used, I used um, Citadel Agrax Earthshade Gloss on all of my metallics. I used um, a Steel Legion Drab Brown, and I used a Flayed One Edge, it's an edge paint, but you can really use any beige. Your Shabby Bone will work fine um, for your second highlight on all your wood. And then for the metallics, I used, I think this is Griffin Gold. It's, it's like a, it's a, it's the dark gold basically color from Citadel. Um, very often if I get these like starter pots, uh, which come in like the easy to build kits, I buy one of those because I want a couple figures. I'll use them for train. They're, they're really like, they're, they're not really, they dry out fast. There's not really enough of them to do like a lot of models with. So I usually just put them aside and I use them for train because they're just handy to have around. Um, and then when my paints get almost empty, I've got a Stormhost Silver here. It's almost done. I'm going to use that for my highlight for all my metallics as well. And that's it. So it's five paints, three rattle cans, a few brushes. And the last thing you want to have is a piece of just off cut um, cardboard. I don't use a plastic palette or a wet palette when I'm getting ready to dry brush. I don't use paper towel either. I tend to use um, cardboard instead because I can, I can usually see it dry a little bit better. And typically it, it, it's, it's as absorbent almost as a piece of paper towel is, but not too absorbent. So you get your paint to dry on the brush, but most of the paint stays on the brush, supposed to being like pulled off with the capillary action, like with the, um, the paper towel. So there's your tools. Uh, I'm just gonna skip ahead right now and come back when this stuff is primed and dry. Okay, so now here we have the first levels of um, spray painting all done. And what I've done is I put down the um, red primer and also this uh, espresso, which it goes a little shiny. Um, so it is actually dry. It's just a little bit shiny. It's, it, it gets kind of tacky um, until it's got like a 24 hour dry period. But what I like to find, or I, what I find is actually, actually, actually I, after I dry brush a little bit, it tends to be fine. So 
A second hack is I'm actually gonna wait to put this down until after I've done all my dry brushing on the wood bits. What that means is I won't be getting any of this Bane blade or sorry, Steel Legion drab um, on the, um, the, the rocks. I don't mind getting it on the stone um, during the dry brushing. And see, I, this is why I like using this is I get a nice even amount of dry paint on here. I'm just gonna dry brush against the grain and get all this done. So like I said, I don't mind getting this on the stones now because I'm just gonna mask this afterwards and spray over top of it. Um, and my second level of dry brushing is just gonna go on everything. So this brown is like the first level of wood dry brushing. The beige is the second level, but I also use the beige on the stone at the same time. So just to, to sort of like make this a bit quicker and mean I don't get any of the brown anywhere, I'm just gonna get the dry brushing of the first stage on the wood finished. I like to do little circles. It really starts to just pick out the textures and I'm not worried too much about creating um, too much of a bright highlight here because once the beige goes down as the second level highlight, you're gonna see the wood grain really pop. But that nice espresso brown really does a good job of just staying in the recesses there and giving the wood some nice depth, nice shadow. All right, so there it is. So I'm gonna do the rest of these, um, and then uh, I'm gonna show you some masking. All right, so the rest of these dry brushed um, and just sort of like base coated with the nice, sort of like subtle brown there. Uh, I'm gonna start masking them off. And I'm just gonna use, I use uh, usually two inch uh, masking tape or inch and three quarter masking tape. And this is painter's tape, which means you can remove it fairly easily. Now you do wanna make sure that your basic layer is dry. And one of the nice things about doing a layer of dry brushing over top of this is it actually removes some of the tackiness. Um, of that, uh, that espresso paint, meaning that when I take off this tape later on, it's not gonna pull a whole bunch of the paint off. Now, if you wanna be really safe, let that dry for like an hour or two, um, and you definitely won't have that problem. You can also see I've got my first dry brush sitting here drying in some paper towel. Uh, one of the reasons I like to have two dry brushes is that one can be drying while one is um, uh, ready to go, and it doesn't slow down the painting process, uh, waiting for your dry brush to get nice and dry. You can kind of like speed dry it by um, making sure that it's uh, it's kind of like wrung out, but I prefer to just give it the old um, give it the old double action there <laughs> and have two instead of one. Uh, now, one of the tricks for when you're doing your masking is that if you do get a little bit too much tape there, because I just kind of eyeballed it, you can just go along with a hobby knife and take off any extra, and it should just pull out like that or just fold it back. Although honestly, with the underside, I'm not too worried about covering stuff up. So there's the first part masked. I'm just gonna get the easiest way to do the edge bits, get a bit more tape and just go side to side and wrap it over like this. Oops. And that should cover that up. And then it's really just this like imperfect corner and you can use any flat off piece to cover that up. Got one more little, if I'm gonna be perfect, let's be perfect. One more little bit here to cover. And then now I can go and actually get this sprayed. And so now this is the tricky part. I'm not gonna, again, I'm gonna go outside of this because this is an aerosol. I'm not gonna do this indoors. Um, this will ruin your life. <laughs> but what's great about these Rust-Oleum ones, they use a standard, um, uh, end fitting for their, uh, their spraying and they do come out nice and um, consistently. You don't tend to speckle and stuff like that. You wanna hold it at about 45 degrees. So if that's flat, spraying down like this is about where you want it to be. What's gonna happen is the air, uh, the paint, and you probably want about maybe eight, 10 inches away when you're doing it, the paint is just gonna hit the raised areas and not enough of it's gonna hit that it's gonna obscure all of this. Um, uh, sort of like the the deeply sort of rooted primer and stuff like that. And you're gonna get that nice red, brown, bricky kind of like mortar in between all of the, um, the, the recesses basically and the details and stuff. You're gonna pick more of it with dry brushing afterwards. Now, I would test spray a couple times because you wanna find every rattle can, especially when you're buying like hard brush or rattle cans, it's gonna have a slightly different pressure of, of like, like a, the, the stuff inside of it um, and a slightly different mix based on how much you sh like shake it of paint inside the can. So 
do a bit of a test spray, find the sweet spot for where it's gonna mist properly and you're not gonna cover it up too much and then start spraying your stuff. So I'm gonna mask the rest of these um, and bring them back in, uh, let them dry and then you'll be able to see what I've got, what I've got basically as far as like that zenithal spray of the chalk paint afterwards. All right, so here they are all masked up and sprayed. You can see it at 45 degrees um, with that great um, chalk paint. So uh, you can see I've managed to retain like a lot of what's in the, the, um, the underside of all of this, like all the details. And you can even leave a little bit of extra brown at the bottom to kind of grime it up and it makes all these colors sort of initially pop. Uh, now, carefully, carefully, gonna take off the masking. What I like to do is I like to take it off from this hard edge first and try not to pull off any of the brown. And what that's gonna do is have all of our wood be nice and preserved. There we go. And if you can take it off from a leading edge first, it'll tend to come off a lot easier. And so you can see here, we've saved ourselves a step basically painting in all this wood brown just by masking it off. And it's basically just, just ready to be dry brushed and Away we go. Robert is your father's brother, as they say in Geordie land. Uh, so we've got um, four of these to do. And what's nice is I actually share the dry brushing of the beige over top between this wooden part and the, um, the stones. Because what we're going to do now is we're going to dry brush this whole thing with a beige tone. I'm using Flayed One Flush, but honestly, you could just use any beige. Um, you'd probably get away just as well with uh, Ushabti bone, old bleach bone, like whatever you have lying around. And whatever you use for terrain. I'm gonna just grab a hobby knife here to get this started. I like left my pocket knife at home today <laughs> and I keep reaching for it and it's not there. It's weird, you get so accustomed to carrying things that they're like always around. Uh, and this way I can also just get kind of slice it when it gets caught on the edges or even just go around the edge here. Uh, these chalk paints I find tend to actually, these Australian paints, except for that brown there, uh, the primer and the chalk paints tend to dry like relatively quickly too, so they're pretty easy to work with. There's not a lot of waiting for drying time, and they dry nice and matte too, which is great for terrain. Uh, that um, red brown is a primer too, specifically designed to also work on plastic. So it's nice because it gives the colors underneath something nice and strong to adhere to. So there's our second little wooden bit, and then there's one left. And again, working from these corners, and you do have to be careful because I've, I've rubbed off a little bit the. Um, the green there just by kind of scratching it with something hard a little bit too early on before it was totally dry but it's gonna get dry brushed on anyway so i'm not super worried about it and there we go our masking is off these guys are ready for some sweet sweet dry brushing so let's get some of this flayed one edge paint i actually i use this for terrain mostly because it's separated really badly i think this is one of my lumpy paints uh, that'll make Antonio, if you ever watches this laugh, Antonio was sitting behind me in the office when I got a batch of lumpy paints. And so they're great for dry brushing because the pigment had kind of solidified. Um, and I can just grab a bunch of pigment again, circles to get it ready. You can see here, this starts to fade around the edge. That's ready for some dry brushing. So let's do a small one first. And this is just going to pick out the edge of the wood, the wood grain. There we go. So now the wood grain's got like a nice lighter dry brush to it. And then I'm gonna go top to bottom. So the trick here is to preserve all of your highlights that you kind of got in there already, just from doing the zenithal spray. You wanna go top to bottom with your dry brushing. So getting some of this sort of dried off on the palette. And then I wanna brush down, right? So I wanna brush down like this. And it's gonna mean that the leading top edges of everything get picked out and give a nice pop to the edges. So you always wanna be going in a downward motion. It can be left to right or, um, uh, you know, side to side slightly, but the more it goes top to bottom, the more you're gonna get that detail to really pop because it's gonna look light at the edges. Grab a little bit more of this paint that I put on here and see it's just gonna pop the edge of all the stone, the edge of all the brickwork, whoops, and the, and the details like these embossed sort of like frescoes and stuff. And there you go. So you can see that kind of like glow now that it's got from the beige. I'm gonna do this all the way around. And what's nice is it works just as well for the wood, doing a beige, as it does for um, the actual stonework. And that's because like in real life, stuff just kind of starts to get dusty, right? Like everything collects dirt on its leading edges, but then when rain comes, it tends to get cleaned off. So the dirt accumulates 
on the in the recesses and the, the high points on everything tend to still have this like sun faded sort of like brightness to them and this is going to help with that and make that kind of pop out and that's really it like these are not except for the metal work which i'm going to show you um these are like 90 percent finished like this is all i'm doing to them and they look good they're super fast so if there's no metal grills or anything on here uh, that is it. That is done. Like there's no metal work on this one at all. There isn't even any like spots for the, yeah, there's nothing. There's no metal work on this one at all. There's no chains. None of these like chain sort of windows that are on some of these things. And if you're not sure how dry the paint is on your brush, try using the side of your dry brush. Cause then at least you're not going to literally put like a big dab of paint on it. <laughs> the side of your dry brush is usually pretty safe. And there we go. So this one's finished, like this one's done, this piece right here is done. Cause I've got some nice beiges on there just to make it, make it pop on the leading edges. And I use this exact same methodology just with different colors for all my kill team terrain. So this, this video kind of stands in memoriam for that kill team terrain too. Uh, because I just use different colors. <laughs> it's the same exact process with different colors. And there you go, quick and dirty, that one's finished. So uh, I'm gonna do the rest of the dry brushing with the beige on these, and we'll come back and we'll do all the metallics. All right, so with all the beige dry brushing done, you can see here the edges have been picked out on everything. Um, two of these three pieces are finished because they don't have any metallics on them. So like this one right here, um, and this one right here are just done. And all they're waiting for right now is a shot of dull coat just to finish everything off. Now this stuff does get handled a lot because it's terrain, obviously. So what I wanna do is I wanna seal it mostly just to, um, take any of the sticky out of that uh that brown that's still there and then just keep the leading edges nice and sealed <laughs> so they don't get beaten up uh and so now when you're deciding on doing metallics if you're doing it a quick and dirty way like this uh you kind of have two choices to make here am i going to do a bronze or i'm going to do a um a, like a steel or iron iron color now if i had done this in gray stone with a darker brown base coat i would probably do iron but because i have this green on here um, i can do bronze instead and it's just going to look like a verdigris underneath so that's where this comes in this um I don't even know what color this is, Griffin something, Griffin Gold, maybe. It's a GW color from one of their starter paints. Uh, and I'm just going to do a heavy dry brush of it on all of these crinkled up, beat up sort of, uh, uh, whatchamacallit, um, bits of gate. And I'm not going to worry too much about where it goes, because that green, as long as I don't go over the edge on like the pillars and stuff too much, um, that green's just going to look like a vertigree. It's going to look like it's just leaking because um, it's gotten wet or whatever, and the bronze has sort of just like turned green. And so I'm just going to go and get in all those panels there. There's some nice doorway stuff right here, like a lock and key. And just give it a nice heavy dry brush so that you've got the, um, the difference in color in there. Get a little more paint on my brush. And I'm not worried, like I said, about coverage. I'm more worried about just getting the tops of it all bronzed out. So I'm not going to go into the sides that don't have any, but you can see here, here's more of the metallics. I'm just getting that banged in there. And now what I'm going to do to kind of define the, the lines between the metallics and the, um, the bronze is I'm going to use that, that gloss, that wash. I'm going to give it all just a nice heavy wash of that uh, Agrax Earth Shade gloss. And what that's going to do is allow me to kind of just sort of separate where the stone begins and the verdigreed bronze ends. And there we go. And then I'm just going to give it a quick and dirty highlight once that's dry. So there we go. All the bronze has just been banged in on both sides. And now we're going to throw a wash in there. That's why I wanted a bigger brush. So get that done. Close you up. Living dangerously, just putting my paint pots out in the open like this. And who's a nice big brush? Who's a, who's a big enough brush? And I don't, I'm not going to put the wash everywhere. I'm just going to put the wash. This is a garbage brush. This was a, this was a putting stuff down brush. We'll use you. You're fine. You're a Michael's dry brush, but you're got a nice hard edge to you. And trick, if you ever want to keep the tops of these open, so you're not going to accidentally spill them, just throw a um, paintbrush cover in there and that'll help you out. So it's just getting some wash on my brush. And I'm just going to go around the edges of where this stuff is. I should want to move this to the other side of the camera. So I'm not, I'm not constantly reaching over it. Go through the edges here with this wash and that's going to let me just darken it up enough around where the metallic work ends and begins. 
that it's gonna pop. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually edge this and give it a final dry brush with a little bit of that Stormhost Silver mixed with just a, t a dot of this paint to make it look like a really light bronze. Um, and that's gonna just kind of pick out the differences in the metallics. And that should work. Again, just going, making sure we kind of do the edges of everything. I'm not so worried about the middle. It's more just about making sure that there's some wash on the edges. Like this. And just outlining it all. And then just moving around where there's too much. And that's just gonna darken up the metallics just enough, but leave some of that green showing through that we have a nice kind of like definition to it. And this stuff does take a bit to dry. So once this is all thrown in here, we'll give this stuff a minute to dry. Now, if you're doing like a whole set of this at once, by the time you get done, the one that I'm currently doing, you're probably gonna be ready to, <laughs> you're probably gonna be ready to paint the next one. So um, you might not have to wait to dry but I'm just doing one here because the rest of these didn't have any metallics on them. So we'll set this down and give it a minute to dry afterwards and then go in there with the silver just to pick out the edges and be finished. There we go. And that's just gonna cause the edges of that to pop a little bit. I'm really not worried about getting a little bit of it on the, on the, um, the stone because the stone's just gonna Get, get a little more definition, really, more, more than anything else. So let's close you up, give you a minute to dry, and I'll be back with some final dry brushing of silver on those metallics. All right, so the last step we're gonna be doing here is just a little bit of a light bronze dry brush. So I'm just gonna get a bit of this, same bronze that I used before, or Griffin Gold, or whatever it is. Get it on my, my makeshift palette. I'm just gonna mix in a little bit of Stormhole Silver. So we're not even gonna try and get a lighter color. You could get a lighter color if you want, but I find that just adding a little silver to this gives it a nice, let's see, light tone. And then I can pick up the edges. Now, just like I did dry brushing with the, um, the actual stone, top to bottom, just flick a little dry brushing on there. And it's gonna pick up the edges, trying to avoid the stone, and just give it a nice shine. And that's it, that's all you're looking for. Don't need, don't need too much. And it's just gonna give it kind of a glow. Other side, same thing. Make the metallics pop a little bit. And cement that this is metal, not stone. And that's it, we're done. So these guys are just gonna get a um, <clears throat> splash of this guy right here, uh, Tester's Dull Coat. I realized the other day that uh, Dull Coat is actually made by the same company that makes all my spray paints, it's Rust-Oleum. <laughs> That's a, that was news to me, I didn't realize that. Um, and then we're gonna be done. So uh, I'm gonna put up a picture right now, you guys can see this stuff on the board with some, uh, some miniatures. And, and there it is all finished. Probably took about actual paint time, 20 minutes. Uh, most of the time is just gonna be waiting for stuff to dry and having your, uh, your spray paints and stuff actually like get, get finished. You're not, um, you're not uh, taking anything off by handling it or mixing it by handling it. And that's all, that's, that is it, finished, start to finish. Hope you enjoyed that quick Let's Paint, uh, taking a look at how to finish off the ruins um, from the newest uh, Age of Sigmar game, which is Warcry. Uh, the same procedures would apply for this to the barricades and stakes, to the stones in the barricades and stakes, um, to the metallics on the bell, the bell tower, like, just, I didn't do anything different. I, the only thing you didn't see me do when I painted the train here was the skeletons got the same dry brush as the wood. And then I picked out the skeleton's metallics with a bit of that Stormhost Silver and then washed everything with that Agrix or Shade Brown. And that's really it. Everything else was done using that same methodology. And it's quick, easy, looks great in the table and um, is a way of getting yourself some more Age of Sigmar terrain all done and dusted. So I hope you enjoyed that. We'll see you for more of these in the future. If I get inspired to do another one, <laughs> text on Mash. I'm working me. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you uh, want to support the channel, of course, like and subscribe and hit the little bell below so you get notifications when I post future content. I do post stuff seven days a week. Uh, if you want to support the channel um, further, you can, of course, buy a t-shirt through Spreadshirt, um, buy a measuring gauge or objective markers from Death Ray Designs. Um, or, of course, most importantly, there is Patreon. Patreon is what makes all this possible. Uh, keeps the lights on, pays for the studio costs, pays for the equipment, model costs, and everything else. And most importantly, um, puts food in my kids' bellies and a roof over their heads. Uh, big thanks to everyone past, future who supported me. Uh, I do this stuff because of you guys, and of course, I will continue doing it as long as I can.